Welcome everyone to the kickoff of our summer 2020 REIT leadership uh, series. Uh, I'm Sam Chandon, uh, the uh, Larry and Clara Silverstein Chair and Dean of the Shack Institute at uh, the NYU School of Professional Studies. Uh, I'm joined by uh, my colleague and friend and the director of the NYU REIT Center, Scott Robinson, um, and the uh, two hosts of uh, this series, uh, Robin Panofka, a uh, member of Shack's board and co-head of the real estate practice at Wachtell Lipton, um, and uh, the other uh, co-head of the uh, real estate practice, also I should mention co-chair of uh, our uh, annual REACH Symposium, which is now in its 25th year, uh, Adam Emmerich. Uh, we're really excited about the program that we've put together this summer. We have just an absolutely stellar lineup of leaders in the REIT uh, sector. There's no one better to kick this off than uh, Sam Zell himself. Uh, but please do join us uh, between now and, and mid-September. Uh, next week, we're joined by Mike Kirby, uh, Ron Havner from uh, Public Storage, Hamid Mogadam, the chairman uh, of Prologis, Sherry Rexrow, Debbie Kafaro, you name it, um, and uh, they are on the list uh, for this series. So it's really not to be missed. Um, we, we've had uh, a very unusual few months at Shack, just uh, as has been the case everywhere else. Uh, but uh, through partnerships uh, and the support of our board and others, uh, we've been able to bring a really extraordinary set of programs to the industry uh, and to our students that we're really very proud of. Um, if uh, you want to stay apprised of some of the programs that we'll be offering and make sure to you know, receive notifications uh, for the, the REACH series as well, we do have a program or event almost every day at SHAC, uh, in part a reflection of our being the largest real estate program in the world. But uh, you know, please do sign up for our mailing list and I'll, I'll share the, uh, the link to that in uh, the, the chat function. Um, one piece of housekeeping, the event is being recorded. There's also a Q&A box. So if you have questions, please drop them into the Q&A. We have an upvoting function. If you see a question that you think is particularly relevant or interesting, click on the like. The most liked questions are gonna rise to the top of the list. Um, so we can see which ones have the broadest appeal. We'll then come back to, to Sam and Robin a little bit later on in the hour to actually pose those questions. Uh, but with that, uh, I will pass it over to Robin uh, to introduce the man who needs no introduction. Well, thanks, Sam. Uh, and uh, Sam Zell, we're really thrilled to start this program with you. Uh, Sam Zell really does need no introduction. Uh, in fact, this program, I think, almost broke Zoom. Uh, and uh, is a new, uh, a new record for uh, NYU Shack. Well over a thousand students uh, and executives and others uh, on this program. So thank you, Sam, for uh, joining us and helping us kick this off. If we could, uh, I'd like to start with a very broad question, uh, and then as we progress, we'll, we'll narrow things down a little bit. So let's start with the big picture, uh, the overall economy, What's your, your sense of where we are now? How does it feel to you? Well, I think that uh, it didn't take very long to eliminate the quote unquote, the expectation uh, or hope that some people had. Uh, I think that the economy is in better shape uh, than people are giving it credit for. Uh, I think unemployment uh, is going to continue to go down between now and the end of the year. Uh, I don't see unemployment being any better than 10% by the end of the year. Uh, that's still a pretty lousy number, but it's a lot better uh, than what we've been dealing with up until now. Um, I think the economy has uh, been cooped up, and I think there's a lot of uh, growth built into just, you know, regaining normalcy. I think people want to be normal. Uh, I think if anything, uh, you know, this is, you know, this is like uh, when, you know, you and I were, when I was in high school, you know. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for drawing the distinction there. <laughs> I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt, but when I was in high school, uh, you know, people still talked about the depression. I mean, well, I think 10 years from now, people are still going to be talking about the lockdown 
in what in the virus and how it affected people's lives and 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 how it affected everything that you know people are. We have a whole generation of people uh, that normally would be you know you know sucked up into the economy and would be you know the next future of this industry uh, or this country you know being kind of left in limbo. Uh, there were a lot of questions and and I don't know that we have. The answers are, uh, or we've had the leadership on any level, uh, either in any political way, uh, toward gaining the answers to that. But I don't think we're in a depression. Uh, I don't think that this is uh, permanently damaging the United States beyond, you know, repeal or anything like that. Uh, this is going to be expensive. It already has been. Uh, and uh, we're also probably going to find out uh, what the limits of uh, what our government can do. Uh, I think we've almost reached those limits so far. I mean, cost us what, $12 billion, $12 trillion, $6 trillion for 90 days, a bridge. Uh, that I think is telling all of us that, uh, you know, we, we can't rely on the government to do it. We're going to have to do it ourselves. And uh, we're going to have to, you know, I think probably accept, you know, accept less and, uh, and work harder. So I want to get into more detail on a lot of those points. But let me ask you this. You, you've been describing, I think, the real economy. But we're also watching the stock market. And... Uh, Oddly enough, the last quarter, just ending the end of June, the S&P 500 went up 20%. The RMZ went up 10%. How does that square with what you just said? What's going on? Well, I'm not sure that uh, the stock market is uh, necessarily reflective. Um, I think that uh, to some extent, the stock market is uh, almost because you have no choice looking out a lot further than that it's ever looked out before. Uh, because you're, there is no alternative. I mean, it's not like you could earn 5% on your money or, or you know, something as an alternative. Uh, so I think that that has attracted a lot of additional capital. I think that's uh, kept the stock market up. Although, you know, reality is a funny kind of thing. If you look at the REIT market, uh, we're what, 22% down on average. Uh, so somebody, you know, somebody is, is being very realistic out there. I think if you quote unquote eliminated the fancy five or whatever, the fang stocks or whatever you call them, uh, I think the results would not look anywhere near as positive as the, as, as, as the statistics make them be the case. I mean, there's very little doubt in my mind if, if, I, if you let me take five or six stocks out of the market. Uh, the market ain't up, uh, the market is down. And uh, now it's not down as bad as it was, but it, ain't, it, it isn't going up a lot. And uh, so I think to some extent, you know, playing headline, you know, nature in, in, in the definition of the market uh, is not necessarily reflective of what's going on. Fair enough. So you said uh, we're not gonna see a V-shaped recovery. Uh, or you had a no, I said we weren't going to see a V-shaped recovery. At best, at best, and most likely we're going to see a U-shaped recovery. In other words, I think that, you know, we we basically improved somewhat. I think we're going to have a kind of a slow period improving toward the end of the year. Uh, that's very different from a radical V-shaped, you know, oh, we, we got hurt, now we're better. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, are you, uh, how, how shallow, when does that uh, upturn start? Is that basically dependent on a vaccine in your mind? No, uh, as a matter of fact, I, you know, I, all kinds of people talk about a vaccine. Uh, if we got a vaccine in place a year and a half from now, I would consider that to be an extraordinary achievement. Uh, I think that the goal must be the elimination of the word death from the equation. In other words, we got to make this virus a bad flu, not 
a, a life and death situ situation. Now, to some extent, uh, you know, I think it's, you know, that situation is contributed by 24 hour cable news channels and, you know, running, you know, lists and, and, and uh, tallies. Uh, the reality is uh, when and if this, you know, this is solved, this is solved by a cocktail, uh, something that in effect somebody can take and yes, they may be sick or they may be on their rear end for a couple of weeks, uh, but the reality is we're not looking to life and death situations. And that to me is what will ultimately release the, release the world where people will in effect make a decision as to whether they might or might not get it, uh, feeling that that re might result in two weeks of discomfort or whatever it turns out, that's a lot different than are you, are you alive or dead or are you gonna take it home to your uh, you know, uh, grandmother or whatever, or even your parents as the case might be. So when are you guessing that happens and that you starts turning up? I think that happens in the fall. Uh, I think by September, you're going to, just like you have a couple of examples already, uh, that steroid and, uh, and that other drug that are being used that are, you know, reducing the death rate. Uh, but I think, you know, I think there's a lot, I mean, you know, I, I talked to Mike Milken, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, and, and they're working on a, on a drug that was originally used for prostate cancer, and it's been around for 100 years. And uh, somehow or other, uh, its effect on COVID, uh, serious COVID patients, is uh, it eliminates the threat to the lungs. I didn't, believe me, I have no idea whether this works or it doesn't work. Uh, I think there are other uh, people out there working on different kinds of potential solutions. But I think something medically that will reduce the severity of the virus is what it will take to get our lives moving again. Okay, great. So uh, if we could, I'd like to kind of drill down a little bit uh, into some of the businesses you're involved with. Uh, I was surprised you mentioned, uh, I think last time we chatted, that less than half of your investments are actually in real estate. Uh, you've got investments in hospitals, oil and gas, logistics, uh, and other sectors. Could we tick them off one at a time and give us a sense of what's happening uh, in those businesses and sectors uh, and how you see the recovery playing out in those? Take hospitals to start with, and then we'll get to Well, we, we own a 4,000-bed hospital chain, uh, primarily in the West. Um, and, um, I mean, it's been quite an experience. I mean, um, among other things, I mean, when the government stops elective surgery, that's the same as putting a tourniquet on uh, cash flow in the hospital business. In other words, alternative surgeries basically subsidize everything else. Mm -hmm. So, the, I mean, I couldn't believe what, you know, that, you know when we, we ended up with 80 or 90 percent elective surgery uh, off the table and you know, and, and the and the and the and overnight the hospital group became you know very endangered. Uh, to the government's credit, they've stepped in. Uh, they prepaid uh, all the medical, um, all the Medicare stuff, so that uh, hospitals will no longer be uh, at the risk of, of you know cash flow crises. Uh, and they've also you know paid out grants that came out of that stimulus bill. Uh, to basically help uh, hospitals cover their losses. I mean, you know, uh, ER, ER rooms were down 70%. Uh, hospital visits were down 40%. Uh, in some cases, we were, we were furloughing people uh, because they weren't, you know, they, 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 they couldn't work. And yet, at the same, very same time, uh, in other places, in other divisions, uh, people are overrun with, with demand. So, um, but I think that um, I, I'm impressed with the way the government has acted so far as it relates to hospitals. Um, 
I, I don't want to be an optimist, but I think maybe they learned something from it and we're likely to see that kind of support uh, continue to be there rather than, uh, you know, issue an, an, another hundred regulations. So is that business already recovering or not yet? Uh, well, it's definitely recovering. I mean, ever since that he, uh, I mean, right now in our hospital chain, our uh, elective procedures are ahead of last year. Oh, really? Uh, you know, now, you know, um, 60 days ago, we were 50, 60 percent behind last year. So, you know, hopefully the government help gets us through that period and we're now running plus, but we're still you know, significantly behind in the ER room and, and significantly behind in visits. And I think it'll take well into the end of the year uh, for that situation to reverse itself. I also think that, you know, we're, you know, everybody's afraid to go into hospitals because of exposure. And uh, to the extent that a cocktail gets related or created, uh, that's gonna change that situation as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oil and gas, your energy businesses? Obviously yeah, uh, we're involved in uh, a lot of different energy business. Uh, I think it's clear to say that uh, we're not drilling anything new. Uh, you know, it's been extraordinarily volatile. It's also an area where there is no capital. And, uh, and you know, part of the key here is, is to allocate the capital uh, effectively uh, and in taking to take everything into consideration, there's a lot of uh, grave dancers running around. There's a lot of people running around. Uh, I but thought there I was only one grave dancer. No, no, there are many. <laughs> uh, but I also think that it's it's probably going to be the fourth quarter before we see things start to sort out and we find out. You know, I mean, right now I think we're in the early stages of price discovery. And uh, I think by, by, the end of the, by the end of the year, uh, we'll have a much better understanding of you know, what kind of capital should be allocated. I mean, the, the destruction in the shale industry uh, is very much a function of the fact that it didn't perform. In other words, it's like the airline business. Uh, it, still hasn't been, it still hasn't returned the capital uh, that grew it. Uh, so I think, you know, we're, we're going to see a repricing in that area and we've seen it already. And I think by the end of the year, we'll know where we are. Okay. Uh, natural gas, you know, yeah. by the way, you know, and, and, you know, we're also in the natural gas business and, you know, this is literally a supply demand situation. The demand side hasn't been very strong. We haven't had a, you know, we had a, two soft winters in a row. Uh, the supply side is unbelievable between the Permian Bay Basin and Marcellus and Haynes. Uh, you know, uh, we, I think we're currently, and the latest thing is uh, natural gas is selling at $1.80 a dollar eighty MCF. Uh, you know, yeah, this, this sold for thirteen dollars uh, ten years ago. So uh, it's been quite a change, and uh, you know, and 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 it makes it a very difficult place to invest. Yeah, yeah. How about logistics? Are you benefiting there from some of the deliveries and yeah, uh, uh, much to our surprise, um, uh, our logistics businesses are actually plus last year, including the last 120 days, and uh, and that's that's very encouraging. Uh, I also think that's an area that could rapidly expand. Uh, uh, as much from from an increased demand uh, as from from you know uh, you know people locked up to uh, to just changing the way we do business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so let's shift to your REITs uh, EQR. How's that been looking? Um, well, I guess the answer is I'm, I'm, we're very encouraged. Uh, you know we. My big fear going in was, uh, you know, how many people would pay rent. Now, we're at the upper tier of the multifamily sector, and uh, we're basically collecting 98, 99% uh, versus a year ago. You know, so, uh, Even in March? Yes. April? March, 
April, May, June, and in beginning of July. So you're so, at the very high end. Uh, as multifamily would go, yes. Uh, so uh, you know, our, we don't we don't have any uh, what I call uh, you know thirty percent of income. I think our average. I, I think we just did a study. Our average was somewhere under twenty. Uh, so rent is not anywhere near as big a, a, a crisis for them as it might be uh, if I were in a B or a C uh, unit grouping. And we're also finding that we have no problem on the multi on the uh, manufactured housing side either. And we're there, our, our company is half manufactured housing, half RV, and the RV side uh, is growing exponentially. In other words, uh, you know, just as these companies that make RVs have, you know, kind of gone crazy, uh, all kinds of people are. I'm a little scared to be a motorcycle rider in this, in, you know, new environment. But uh, there's a lot more RVs. I think there was an article on the either New York Times or the Wall Street Journal today about uh, all these rookies driving these RVs uh, and people suffering accordingly. Maybe you should trade in the motorcycle for an RV. Well, I, I, I would be safer, I'm sure. <laughs> um. So that business, even more collections than the uh, apartments? I mean, nobody, you can't stop paying on a manufactured home. It's, it's Well, in, in, in terms of multifamily, um, the residential side of our collections and our leasing, we're 95% occupied today, uh, is, is pretty good. And we don't have a lot to complain about. Rates are probably, down, you know, one or two percent world, you know, countrywide, uh, more in some areas, less in others. Uh, in some areas, we still have increases going through. Uh, the place where, where that company is affected is, particularly in New York, where we have a lot of ground floor retail. So where we have Walgreens or we have Starbucks, uh, and we have corporate guarantees, uh, we obviously haven't suffered. Uh, where we have suffered is, you know, little restaurants, nail shops, uh, uh, dry cleaners, uh, uh, you know, those small entrepreneurs. Uh, we've obviously, you know, we're only collecting probably 45% right now. We're, we're doing right now more than anything else is trying to keep those guys in business. And we do so by rent deferrals and by helping them in any way we can. Uh, and uh, because, you know, all you gotta do is drive down the streets in New York and, and there's nobody on the streets. So if I were owning a nail shop or whatever I was, or a little restaurant, uh, I'm not in great shape. So our goal there is to try and keep them, you know, in one piece. Okay, great, That's a great overview. So let's let's shift and talk about opportunities. You mentioned the term great ads earlier. You're famous for making a lot of money buying distressed assets, lots of distress out there. When is the right time to pull the trigger? What sector? How do you how do you think about that? Well, let me see if I can answer you according to number one. Um, we don't buy sectors. Uh, we buy deals. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, we may have, I may not be enthusiastic about hotels right now, uh, but you know, give me the right price and I can do the discount in my head and figure out whether I'll be alive when the business returns. So it's transactions that are you're driving it. I would tell you that right now there aren't any transactions and there isn't any price discovery. And the spread between what the, the owner thinks his property is worth and what the buyer thinks the property is worth is, you know, as a percentage, probably immense, uh, you know, uh, compared to previous periods. Um, so, but that's because there are no transactions. There won't be any transactions until the banks start to turn the screw. Uh, I think we'll see that you know, starting in the fall. And, uh, and with, you know, we just had a, a thousand, uh, I don't know how many unit 
uh, multifamily under construction here in Chicago stop construction uh, because the because the construction lender wants to look at the whole situation. I think we'll see a lot of stuff under construction around the country stop uh, as people kind of re reassess their equity requirements and uh, and what you know what are expect what are reasonable expectations. I also think in some markets in the country, uh, you know, you know, New York as an example, there's a, a, a very significant number of very high end units uh, that have been sitting vacant for a long time. Uh, I think that, that you know we're likely to see the banks force those into the market and force price discovery. So um, you know, so overall. Uh, I think you got to look at each segment of real estate uh, individually, but I think I'd start with retail, and uh, you know, and I consider retail, um, you know, it, you know, uh, some I, I once had an experience where I bought a shopping center in the '70s, and it turned out that you know it was just at a bad location, and we turned it into a flea market, we turned it into an ice skating rink, we did everything. And I learned that we gave away free rent, and we found out that free rent was too expensive. There is no traffic. <laughs> and so consequently, I think that retail today uh, may be, you know, may be even more impaired than conventional wisdom suggests. Uh, and certainly locking up the country for three or four months and forcing, uh, this, forcing a lot of people who had never shopped online to shop online uh, is certainly not going to help uh, real, the re retail real estate. Uh, I also think that although you know the, the great savants talk about the fact that retail retail, retail re real estate occupies the quote unquote best locations, uh, there's something called supply and demand, and when there is a multiple of best locations available, uh, that has a way of impacting value. So I, I wouldn't even consider. There's almost I, I don't even know whether uh, whether somebody could offer me a retail deal that was cheap enough uh, to do. Maybe uh, I'm less uh, you know saying what I'm about hotels. Um, I think you know I think that some you know there was an article the other day in in I think it was the New York Times where they talked about the fact that 25 percent. Uh, of the hotels in New York City won't reopen. And I think that's true. The question is, what will they be converted to? Some will be converted to uh, additional residential, which is probably a good thing. But, uh, but the general, uh, the Hyatts, the Marriott's, the, you know, the, the Four Seasons, the, the, the Omnis, the Knowns, uh, I think will you know, slowly get back in business now. The cost of reopening these places is going to be immense. So I think these are going to be, you know, again, you see, I think you, you'll start to see these hotels come on the market because the cost of reopening them is like, you know, a whole new, uh, you know, imposition uh, of equity. Yeah. Uh, I think the multifamily business is probably, and the manufactured housing business is likely to be least. Uh, affected, uh, and that comes to you know. I, I don't consider. I mean, there's this uh, you know digital reality, and and uh, you know. But I think the, the single family house business is is good and is likely to continue to be good. Uh, but I think those companies will have trouble replacing their their inventory as they you know sell them and and deal with real depreciation. Uh, it really kind of comes down to the office building market. And uh, there are a lot of savants and a lot of conventional wisdom that says that, you know, the office building business is very different or is going to be very different uh, tomorrow than it was today. Uh, I'm not one of them. Um, I think that, you know, motivating by modem is, uh, is an interesting concept, but not one I'd like to run a business on. Uh, I think we're social animals and, and people need to trust and understand each other and they don't get that through a Zoom lens. Um, and so I think that yes, uh, there may be some people who will work remotely, 
But then again, uh, you know, they, they talk about, well, I'm going to move to from New York City to Keokuk, Iowa. And then my question is, what do you do at five o'clock? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, because there's, you know, there's two other people in this town that's the same age you are. Uh, you know, so, you know, that doesn't, that, that kind of thinking, from my perspective, it, it sounds great to live out in the boondocks, uh, but I'm not sure it sounds so great the second month. So, now, having said that, I should add that the, the, the office market in this country is oversupplied. Uh, I mean, we had this temporary thing called we work at shared offices and, uh, and you know, and every, every iteration of that since the beginning of time has gone broke and we work in company are no different. They're the marginal suppliers. And when there's, you know, when you see a whole bunch of new buildings or you see a, a Hudson Yards get built, uh, you know, that changes the game uh, and, and eliminates the marginal supplier of space. Let me ask you this, if the reason uh, you're not investing in assets right now is the bid ask is too great, in part, in sectors you like, what about buying depressed REIT stocks where there is transactions? They're just not low enough? Well, I think, I think they were low enough, uh, you know, come whatever it was, April 1st or something. Yeah. They may, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a stock market guy. There may be another opportunity like that. But generally speaking, uh, I, I think the discounts are not sufficient uh, to make it a screaming buy. That doesn't mean that there aren't some situations that uh, are interesting. Uh, remember, when you buy stock, you buy liquidity, but you don't buy control. And so that's really, you know, that, that makes that a very different kind of an investment. Uh, I think there are a lot of REITs today that I think are going to be great investments. Uh, you know, long-term positive cash flow, uh, et cetera. But I think that, uh, you know, the kind of uh, bottom fishing we're talking about is not buying uh, REITs 20% off. Mm -hmm. So uh, in EQC, Equity Commonwealth, you've got about $3 billion of cash sitting there to deploy. Yes, sitting on it for quite a while now. When when is that? When are you going to start moving that cash into something? Well, you know, we took over EQC five years ago. Uh, when we took it over, we had no cash and 150 properties. We now have four properties and 3.4 billion dollars of cash. So I'd say that this is not something that, this is something that has been the plan since day one. And, uh, and you know, we're sitting there and waiting for opportunity. We think that uh, come the end of this year, uh, we will begin to see uh, transactions occur and, and a repricing of the commercial real estate market. And that will create opportunity for us to effectively use that capital. You're, you're, uh, you've mentioned the fall and the end of the year a few times, so it yes. sounds like you're fairly uh, short-term optimistic. That's not too far away. Well, I'm, what I'm optimistic is that we're not going to have a September relapse. Uh, and I, I actually think that what we're seeing right now in terms of, of virus growth uh, is probably uh, being brought forward from, from you know, from the beginning of the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, if we, uh, if we perceive that this virus is out of control, um, that, that changes my timetable. But my current feeling is that we're close to the end of the peak, so to speak. And uh, I think things will get significantly better throughout the rest of this year. Good, well, that's encouraging, uh, if you're right, for the NYU students out there who are that'll be looking for jobs relatively. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be looking for a job right now. Don't misunderstand me. <laughs> ah, fair enough. So I see tons of uh, audience questions piling up. Let me, uh, before we open it up, let me uh, throw out a few trends that people have identified out there and see if we can get just a quick reaction from you uh, on some of them. Uh, this one, you, you've touched a little bit talking about Iowa. 
but the, the death of New York City, the death of cities generally, people are not gonna wanna move to the burbs, live with the cows rather than humans. What do you, what do you think? Tell them to send me a postcard. <laughs> You'll visit uh, in your RV? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll visit in RV. I just, you know, I think that that's, you know, that's really wonderful and yes, uh, you know, uh, but the bottom line is that all those NYU students that are out there right now, uh, don't want to graduate and live in Keokuk, Iowa. Uh, they want to graduate and they want to live uh, in in twenty four seven cities and places where things are happening. And uh, I don't think uh, this is going to change. So trend number two, the the so called sharing economy, the Airbnbs, things like that. What's this whole COVID thing going to do there? Well, it's it's interesting that. Number one, if you really, you know, when, when, when somebody mentions the word Airbnb, uh, you think about, uh, you know, the, the extra bedroom. Uh, the reality is that that business started as the extra bedroom and has morphed into, uh, a, a, you know, a, a on-call housing. Um, and uh, so I think that uh, that's a lot less sharing, so to speak, than was originally concepted. The rest of the sharing world, uh, I, I'm not a big fan of. Uh, I, I can't believe that somebody, one of your NYU students is going to uh, graduate and, uh, and live uh, in an apartment building with one bathroom and 10 uh, participants and, and, and love sharing. Uh, that just doesn't, that, that's not my, my perception. Uh, I think, you know, we start out with these shared cars. Uh, that's kind of gone by the wayside. Uh, I think that who we are uh, is very much, you know, uh, subject to where we live and how we live. And, uh, and I don't think uh, uh, we may be becoming more socialistic than I want to uh, believe, but I don't think we're getting to the we live together scenario. You don't sound like you're moving to a kibbutz anytime soon. Not soon. <laughs> so offices, let's talk about a couple of trends there. I'd be curious how you think this affects supply and demand. You've got this de-densification because people want to have space. Uh, you've got fewer people wanting to go into the office, arguably. I mean, even if it's 10% of people who want to live part-time in Iowa, that's going to reduce demand. Uh, how, how does it all shake out? Increased demand of office? Decreased demand of office? Space? Um, I think it's likely that um, office demand uh, will not meet, that, that there will be too much supply for the next few years. Um, but do I think that there's a dramatic change? Unlikely. Uh, do I think that uh, we're going to see the recreation of uh, a major suburban office complexes? No, sir. I don't think so. Uh, so I think basically, uh, you know, the future of office is, is likely going to be affected by, uh, you know, how much it costs to build space and, uh, and where it is. And, and projects like uh, Hudson Yards uh, may turn out to be uh, great projects for grandchildren or great grandchildren. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, warehouse demand, the, the theory that it simply bypasses uh, retail, goes straight from the factory to the warehouse to the home. So there ought to be massive demand for warehouse. Are you buying warehouses? Um, I think we would consider it. It's, I would say that warehousing today is uh, the flavor of the month. Um, I can't help but remember, you know, I'm an old man, so I was around when, uh, you know, in the 60s when the entire warehousing business uh, was one or two Texans and the rest of it was insurance companies. Now, when an insurance company acts as an entrepreneur, uh, that tells you how difficult the business really is or isn't. And uh, it's still, you know, one big box. It's still, you know, one big lease. Uh, and therefore, the ability to create it is, is immense. 
there's no NIMBY to the warehousing in business. So I think that, uh, you know, given any amount of time, uh, we will overbuild the warehouse business. And I don't think there's a lot of intrinsic, uh, you know, value uh, in the existing portfolios. Fair enough. Uh, last question, and then I'm going to turn uh, to uh, Adam and Sam and Scott for audience uh, questions. Uh, political risk. Uh, in one of our prior conversations, you upset a bunch of people by talking about political risk in the United States. Uh, how do you view the political risk now, given the government's response to COVID, uh, the whole Trump era, and so on? Are you, would you rather be investing other places at this point? You, or do you feel like things are relatively under control? In yeah. this um, I don't know whether things are relatively under control in this country, but if we start with the, some, the, the issue of what are the options, uh, I'm not sure I see uh, any place else in the world that is more attractive to invest than the United States. We are still a country of the rule of law. The rule of law does exist. And uh, consequently, um, I think in these uncertain times, uh, the, the, uh, the rule of law and the traditions that exist in this country, however they may be changed, uh, are still a lot stronger than almost anywhere else in the world. You know, as, as, uh, as a lawyer and someone who's noticed that you uh, abandon the legal career and uh, don't have the highest regard for lawyers, I'm pleased to hear an appreciation for the rule of law. This is encouraging. Well, I would not suggest that the rule of an appreciation of the rule of law is in any way suggestive of appreciation of lawyers. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right, on that, uh, audience questions. Uh, Adam, Sam, I know you've been accumulating them. Sure. You know, uh, Sam, folks want to know your opinion on everything from the future of the New York City subway system to Kanye West's uh, run for president. Uh, but let's stick to the real estate stuff. Um, you know, the, with the cancel rent movement has not really developed momentum. Um, but do the underlying drivers of that, some of the, um, uh, you, you, so, some of the popular push for rent relief, does it change the risk profile or dynamic of the multifamily sector and, and investment? Well, I think that, uh, you know, uh, rent control generally is something that sounds terrific unless you got it. Um, every single, you know, scenario where rent control has, such as Santa Monica or New York City, uh, you know, everybody's finally come to the conclusion that it's not the, the answer. Um, I think that, yes, there is higher uh, risk uh, politically today than there was uh, 10 years ago, but I have a lot of faith in the American people and, uh, and I believe that uh, uh, we will not see the kind of destructive rent control that we've seen in the past. Adam, jump in. Sure, Sam. Great to see you today. And obviously, the commentary was fabulous thus far. In, in terms of a, sort of a related uh, political overlay sort of question, one, one audience question was, you know, the assumption is that right now we're, we're seeing a kind of an artificially induced, both financially and politically, uh, per period of uh, lack of lack of foreclosures, forbearance, do you think we're going to see a kind of a breaking of the dam maybe in the fall, as you talked about on other fronts, uh, where there'll be uh, a wave of foreclosures, restructurings, and possibly uh, investment opportunity on the properties that are subject to that wave? Um, I think, number one, that uh, a lot of my comments about the fall are very much reflective of the fact that I think we're currently in a period of, you know, uh, everybody's afraid to, you know, to see what happens and then we're going to see what happens. Yes, there will be some evictions. Yes, there will be foreclosures, uh, but none at a scale uh, that 
uh, you know, this is not uh, a repeat of 1991, 1992. Uh, but we're going to, we're definitely going to see price discovery, and price discovery is going to change uh, the economic value of real estate. Uh, Sam, I think you know, by design, most of us uh, are, are believers in cities, and you mentioned that folks moving to the suburbs can, can, send, uh, can send you a postcard. Um, can you comment a little bit on the fiscal challenges being faced by cities, whether it's Chicago or New York? You know, we hear about the potential for fiscal crises, and I don't know whether that's on the scale of what we saw in places like Philly and New York in the, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but how much of a factor is that going to be in the competitiveness of cities and attracting jobs and businesses going forward? Um, I, I, I think that almost all of the cities are in trouble. Uh, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, et cetera. Um, but frankly, you know, if, if you think about it, there's almost never been an, 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 an entity more created to trouble than cities. Uh, um, particularly as long as they're politically run. And so there'll be some crises and there'll be some, uh, you know, reorganizations. Uh, um, unlikely we're going to see a bunch of Detroit, uh, but I think we're going to see uh, some change occurring uh, between, you know, the old way of running cities and the new way of running cities. So, yes, I think there's going to be, you know, I mean, you know, look what's happening in uh, public transportation. Uh, you know, that the whole of, trouble, tr tr of, of public transportation is uh, immense. And, uh, you know, and yet the enthusiasm for it is not there. So there's going to be huge, you know, economic changes as a result. Adam? Sam, uh, some of the audience seem to take a little bit of offense at your characterization of their, their hometowns as a place where, you know, two guys couldn't find a beer to drink together. And uh, I've talked in particular about places like Louisville and Nashville and other so-called mid-tier cities that are, you know, many notches above some, some place in, in, in rural, whichever place that uh, they, they don't think they are. You think there is a resurgence or a surgence uh, of of uh, mid tier or you know more user friendly smaller smaller cities as a kind of a halfway house between exciting but unmanageable with uh, public transportation New York and these these uh, rural idols that are going to bore people out of their minds in five minutes. Um, you know, I've always liked mid tier cities, and that was really where I started my real estate career. Um, Mid-tier cities have generally not been very competitive with the 24-7 cities. Um, I would hope that they would be going forward, and certainly uh, Nashville, and uh, you know, is, is is an example of, of a mid-tier city that has really done incredibly well. Um, whether you know whether they will be midpoints or not. Much depends on those NYU kids you're talking about. And are they gonna, you know, spend four years and two hundred thousand dollars getting a, an education and, and say, gee, uh, uh, I'll work for uh seventy-five percent less in, 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 in a lovely mid tier city, or am I twenty-three years old and uh, I'm making hundred and fifty grand and uh, you know and I wanna be where all the action is. Speaking of those uh, NYU students, and Sam, we always make sure at events like this to invite students from other academic programs. We want everyone to have a, a chance to hear from uh, the industry's leadership. Uh, many of them are asking, uh, given conditions in the market today, where might they focus their energies in thinking about career opportunities? Go to medical school. <laughs> Sam, you, a few years ago, you created a massive oversupply of dentists. You said go to uh, dentistry school. So right. Well, you know, now we have too many doctors. You know, whatever they get. <laughs> I mean, the answer is, like every other answer, um, there are tough times and there are good times. Uh, there's very aggressive kids uh, who uh, find jobs, find opportunity, find ways to take risk and succeed, and, and others uh, say, how about me? And uh, so I, I, I don't really think that this is any different than 10 years ago uh, 
know, we had a recession. People uh, ended up uh, postponing what they wanted to do for a while and then well, slowly but surely found the answers. Adam? So a lot of people are asking, uh, you know, I mean, I think you touched on it a little bit, but maybe we can dive dive further. I mean, what what do you, where do you see this wave of retail bankruptcies? We saw Brooks Brothers file for bankruptcy today. Where where does where does the whole thing that we have shopping mall companies buying retailers? Where where does that end up? Well, um, I think you know it's, it ends up with the fact that we were over retailed by a big amount. Uh, that's slowly you know changing. I mean, you know, you, for a while there you could walk into a, a mall and there were. 30 different shoe stores. You know, half of them were sold sneakers. Well, maybe we didn't need 30. And I, I think we didn't. And so we're seeing a Darwinian process in retail that has obviously been kicked in the rear by uh, online shopping. So in effect, from my own perspective, I'm going to look at retail and say, it's either the top or the bottom. And no, nowhere in between is retail going to be a, a good investment? So, uh, Sam, we're almost out of time. Uh, you, you talked about 30 uh, shoe stores, which reminded me of a paper you wrote probably 25 years ago now, where you said it would end up being only 30 REITs in the world because the world doesn't need, I, I think we still have about 150 of them. Yeah. Um, maybe you're going to end up being right at some point, but well, I think I'm right. I think I'm right already. In other words, because I think that there's give or take about 30 relevant REITs, uh, 30 with significant liquidity, 30 with significant size, and 30 that matter. And then there's another 100 uh, that trade by appointment or uh, or own, uh, you know, um, um, the, the northeast corner of the west, you know, West End of the state of Montana and call themselves a REIT. So uh, I think that, that in effect, the REIT industry has done it almost exactly what I thought it would do, which is there's give or take 30 of these big uh, entities that really move the needle. And then a lot of little guys that over time all get eaten up. Yeah, no, fair enough. I think it's about 80% of the market cap is in those 30. 30 so what right. happens to that other, those other 100? Is this, are you predicting some kind of a M&A where they get well, absorbed? Well, I, I mean, I, I think that if, 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 forget about the word read and just think about publicly held companies. Uh, there have been lots of areas that get, you know, there, there used to be, what, 100 car manufacturers. And now there are three. Uh, and, and 25 years ago, there were 20. And so, in effect, I think in the same uh, manner, the read arena is going to end up being, uh, those 100 are going to be acquired, they're going to liquidate, uh, they're going to be viewed as value plays. So activists are going to go and say, we got to go you know, get that and liquidate that, et cetera. So I think the same, that, that's the normal evolutionary process. So last question, uh, if you were to write another paper now, I think you called that old paper, The Forces Changes Real Estate Forever, and it's essentially being borne out. We've got a trillion dollar market now. Now write the paper in the next two minutes for the next 30 years. What are, the, what are we going to see? Well, I think that uh, the REIT concept and the idea of real estate as an asset class uh, I mean, when I went out and, and raised institutional money in 1989, 80% uh, of the pension funds that I called on did not have a real estate allocation. Can you believe that? 80%. And, and you start by, the first of the conversation was all about how important real estate was. Well, that's no longer the case. Everybody's got a real estate allocation. I think the trillion dollar REIT market will be a two or three trillion dollar REIT market in 10 or, 10 or 12 years. Uh, as you know, those 30 key companies and a couple of the hundred, you know, become serious monsters. And I think that's likely to continue. 
I think the biggest single change between 25 years ago and today and tomorrow is the fact that almost all, not all, but almost all of real estate is institutionally backed. So those institutions are all using their capital to back. So in effect, there's Mr. A and Mr. B are entrepreneurs, but instead of entrepreneurs that are playing with their own money, they're entrepreneurs that are playing with other institutions' money. And that's likely to make the market move a little slower and probably um, mitigate the the sharp ups and downs that would normally occur in an entrepreneur-driven market. Fascinating. Well, Sam, sadly, we are out of time. Uh, really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Time. Really interesting talk. Thank you very much, and thank you all for thank watching. Thank you, guys. <laughs>